G'day gymnastic skill seekers. Welcome back to another one of my flexibility rants. Today I want to talk about a common aspect of pike and flex pike and pancake flexibility that gets overlooked. So if you're like me and you want to increase your pike or your pancake flexibility, then you're probably going about it in terms of stretching your hamstrings and working on core compression strength. And these are the most common things that a lot of people focus on when they want to increase their forward fold capacity. When I was doing this, I felt like there was something missing. I'd go to work doing these stretches and I would often feel the tightness in my calf muscles, not in my hamstrings. So I decided that I needed to focus more on stretching the calves. Now, initially, this might not make sense because you think, okay, in a pike or a pancake where we're plantar flexing the ankle. We're not dorsiflexing the ankle. So how does the calf muscle impact our pike and pancake flexibility? The thing is, there's two key mu muscles that we're gonna talk about. There's the gastroc, which is the upper part of the calf muscle, and there's the soleus, which is the lower part of the calf muscle. Now the gastroc crosses the knee joint and the ankle joint, and the soleus only crosses the ankle joint. When we start to think about pike and pancake flexibility, we start to think about, can I keep the knees locked? Am I able to keep the legs straight? Now we see a lot of gymnastic skill seekers struggling to perform movements like L-sits, toes to bar, pistol squats, skin the cat, press the handstand, and more, because they have to bend their knees. So their technique, let's say, isn't pretty. They might be able to muscle their way through it, but it's not strict gymnastics form. And the calf can be the cause of the inability to straighten the knee. Now you might think, okay, we're gonna to go to work and we're gonna stretch the gastroc. And this is done by straight-legged calf stretches because it crosses the knee joint, it makes sense. But what about the soleus that only crosses the ankle joint? This is where it gets a little bit technical because both the gastronemius, the gastroc, and the soleus join to make the Achilles tendon, which is the tendon that goes under the foot and around the ankle, okay? So by stretching the Achilles, we actually help to lengthen the overall calf muscle, both the gastroc and the soleus. Now to stretch the Achilles, it's better to perform bent knee calf stretches, okay? Bent knee calf stretches target more of the soleus or more of the lower part of the calf, meaning they're gonna hit more of the Achilles. Now the Achilles tendon is the thickest and strongest tendon in the human body. So it's gonna take some specific training to be able to lengthen that particular tendon. So what I'm gonna say is calf raises are a really good way to strengthen and lengthen the, um, the calf. And we're gonna to wanna to look at both straight leg and bent knee calf raises or calf stretching variations to do so. One thing I nearly forgot to mention was the eversion and inversion of the ankle when performing calf raises. Often when we perform calf raises, people like to favor one side. Maybe they push more towards the knuckle of the big toe and the pinky toe lifts off the elevated surface. Now, this is gonna have an impact on the calf and how we stretch and strengthen the calf. So what we wanna to try to do initially is we wanna to try to keep the weight pretty much balanced over the foot. So we're pushing into the knuckle of the big toe and the knuckle of the pinky toe when we're doing our calf raises. When I talk to people about their back squats and balancing their back, back squats, where they should feel the weight in their back squat, I talk about the three prong approach. So we're talking about, do you feel the weight in the middle of the heel? Do you feel the weight under the knuckle of the big toe? And do you feel the weight under the knuckle of the pinky toe? We're trying to keep the weight evenly distributed here. If we start to get eversion or inversion in the squat, then we can start to cause torque or tension in the knee and end up with knee pain, or this could transfer into the hips or lower back. Often people have really tight big toes because we're walking around in shoes all day and we don't have much big toe extension going on. So we avoid the big toe. People turn their feet out when they squat because they don't have big toe extension. So we could do big toe stretches as well to start to stretch that. But we can also do this in the calf raise by just being aware. Where is the weight under the foot? Is the knuckle of the big toe down? Is the knuckle of the pinky toe down? Give it a try and see where you put the weight under your foot when you do your calf raises. 
Now, I was an endurance athlete for many years in, in a past life. I used to compete in marathons and triathlons. So I think my calves got tight from just doing years and years and years of running. So we think about this and it's you know a lot of partial range repetitions. But in our everyday life, you know, we walk around not taking our ankle into maximum dorsiflexion. As the saying goes, if you don't use it, you lose it. So calf stretches and calf raises are a good thing for us to focus on if we want to improve the strength, flexibility, and stability of the ankle. Now, before we start, I'd like to say it's a good idea to test the range of motion in your calves. So we can do an ankle dorsiflexion test knee to wall, and we measure the distance away from the wall that we can place the foot and still touch the knee to the wall while keeping the foot flat on the ground. We want to do this for both feet, okay? The first thing we're looking for is can you get your knee to cross over the vertical line of the toes? If not, then you definitely want to be working on more single leg variations in your strength training, split squats, step ups, single leg calf raises to increase that mobility before you start working on things like goblet squats, barbell back squats, barbell front squats, the big bilateral movements. The second thing we want to look at is we want to compare left to right. Do you have structural balance in the range of motion of dorsiflexion in your left ankle and your right ankle? If so, that's awesome. Go ahead, start doing your back squats and your front squats. If not, well then we really want to target the range of motion in the ankle that's missing it to try and bring them up to be even. If there's a an imbalance between the two, chances are when you squat, especially when it gets heavy, you're going to have a twist. You're going to favor the side that has greater range of motion. Now, this could lead to ankle pain, knee pain, hip pain, or lower back pain if left untreated. Some people might get away with it for a short period of time, but in the big picture of things, um, in longevity, we want to make sure that this is not happening. So it's wise to spend time working on that flexibility and, and, and making sure it's balanced between left and right. Again, if it's not, then you really want to work on single leg variations. You can still do walking lunges. You can still do split squats. You can still do step ups. You can still train the lower body uh, and work on bringing up that balance before you get back to you know, the barbell back squat. So before you get into the calf stretches, let's do the ankle dorsiflexion test. I've created a video for this, which I'll link below. Try it out, get a score on the board. It doesn't have to be a huge number. Um, and then the goal is to try and improve this or to see that you're increasing the range of motion by actually working on you know, your, your calf stretches. Okay, so where do we start? Again, I'd like to say we start with unilateral exercises. So we might start with a single leg calf raise. This can be performed at body weight or it could be performed by holding you know, a dumbbell in one hand, preferably on the same side as the foot that you're working. If you've got access to a calf raise machine at your gym, then go for it. You can use that calf raise machine and you'll be able to load the calf quite heavy with that. Now we can perform both single leg straight leg calf raises and we can also perform single leg bent knee calf raises. That way we can target the gastroc and we can target the soleus muscle. The bent knee variations are going to target the lower part of the calf, the soleus muscle. But we want to we want to train both so we can put both of those in there. Now whenever we're training the calf, they're predominantly slow twitch fiber. So the best way to train the calf is to work on long times under tension. So this could be a high volume of repetitions or it could be adding long isometric holds in the calf stretch or the ankle dorsiflex position. So if you're doing 10 reps and there's a three second pause at the bottom of each repetition, that's only 30 seconds of time under tension. So it's not enough. We really wanna be working towards 60 seconds and beyond while we're training the calves. So you could do 10 reps with a three second pause and then on the final rep hold a 30 second pause at the bottom of the um of the range of motion there reaching the 60 seconds of time under tension and the next day you're probably going to have sore calves just be warned so with all of the calf raises let's try to push them out to 60 seconds or beyond for each set that you're working on so another variation that i like to use is the seated barbell calf raise. So if you don't have access to a seated calf raise machine, we can set this up by having a, 
an elevated surface to sit on and an elevated surface to elevate the foot on. We can load this with the barbell, which allows us to obviously increase the weight and go quite heavy with this. Remember, the calves are quite a strong muscle. They carry around our body weight every day, so they should be able to work with quite heavy weights. You might want to build this up over time, but yes, gradually increasing the weight. There's no reason why you can't do a calf raise, a barbell calf raise at your body weight on the barbell. Now, if you don't have access to a barbell, you can place a dumbbell on top of the knee. You can put a stack of weight plates on top of the knee, whatever you can do to load this. I just find that with the barbell, we can go a lot heavier than we can with dumbbells, kettlebells, or weight plates. When we're using the barbell, it's best to use a bar pad or to wrap a towel around the barbell, especially when it gets heavy. That's just for comfort. Again, we want to be doing sets of high number of repetitions or with long time under tension isometric holds and pauses here to be hitting those sort of 60 seconds but i find this a great way to start to increase ankle dorsiflexion range of motion give the seated barbell calf raise a try now we can also do calf stretches it's not just calf raises but what i like about calf raises is the ability to strengthen and stretch the calf at the same time so it's a really good way to work on improving strength and flexibility and stability in the ankle but we could do just a straight up standing calf stretch where we elevate the ball of the foot on a, on a small incline give the ankle dorsiflexion then we hinge at the hips as if we're doing maybe like a split stance good morning and it's good to have a target to aim for so we could be leaning forward and touching our head to a wall or to an upright in the squat rack and as ankle dorsiflexion improves we're going to be able to go for a greater range lean forward more so another one of my favorite exercises is the standing calf stretch the toe elevated isometric holds touching the head to a target have a play with this check out your range of motion you know what can you do on both sides again we can look at the imbalance here between left and right um, the same as what we did in the test we can also experiment with the foot position. So often when we perform calf raises, we're keeping the toes pointing straight ahead and we're roughly sort of hip width apart. This is good and it sort of trains the medial part of the calf, but there's no reason why we can't turn the toes in and have the heels turned out. And this will train more of the medial, okay, the inner part of the calf muscle. We can also do the opposite where we have the heels turned in and the toes turned out. And this will train more of the lateral, the outer side, the outer outer edge of the calf muscle. So we can play with these different foot positions that could be on a bilateral calf raise or even on a unilateral calf raise. We can also stretch in these different positions. You can experiment with this and find the line of tightness. Where do you feel the stretch or what's the limiting range of motion that you have in the calf raise in the different foot positions. So don't just do calf raises with the foot pointing straight ahead. The final thing I want to talk about is the opposite muscle, the antagonist muscle of the calf. And we're talking about the muscle on the front of the shin, the tibialis anterior. Now, a lot of times when we're performing calf raises or calf stretching, we're focusing on the calf muscle, but we're not focusing on the tibialis anterior, the muscles on front of the shin. What we can do here is we can actually contract those muscles to help pull us deeper into ankle dorsiflexion. So not only are we passively hanging out in the calf stretch or the calf raise, we're trying to activate the muscles on the front of the shin, contract them, shorten them to pull us deeper into that range of motion. Now we can strengthen the tibialis anterior with um, specific tibialis anterior exercises like seated on a bench doing ankle plantar flexion dorsiflexion with a dumbbell strapped to our foot or a kettlebell looped over the foot uh, we can also use a band for this we can do this bilateral and unilateral as well to train that we can also do a back to wall tibialis raise to strengthen the tibialis muscles there as well so there are a lot of variations around that we can use to help improve again ankle strength stability and flexibility by training the opposite muscle of the calf here now a lot of times when we're performing our pike and pancake flexibility we can forget to contract the anterior chain muscles so in my last post i talked about how to 
start training core compression strength and how we have to use our core compression strength to pull us deeper into our pike and pancake. We're not just passively hanging out in that position. We're using the muscles on the, of the anterior chain to contract and shorten and pull us deeper. Now this includes the tibialis anterior. We can use these muscles to help pull us deeper into our standing pikes, our standing pancakes, or even when we're performing seated variations. Although we want to point the toes to look pretty, there's no reason why we can't train it by doing ankle plantar flexion and dorsiflexion to help us sink deeper into the range of motion. Contract the muscles of the anterior chain, pull yourself deeper, then relax the muscles of the anterior chain and see if you can hold that range of motion there. An exercise like a standing pike forward fold tibialis contraction can start to teach us and build an awareness of hey, if I contract the tibialis anterior, I can actually pull myself deeper into the standing pike. So it's something to play around with and something to experiment with here. Are the calves a limitation to your pike and pancake flexibility? Or maybe you just need to stretch and strengthen your ankles to improve the depth of your back squat or the depth of your split squat or whatever it is that you're working on. But it's definitely something that we should be a part of our training. We should be including specific ankle work, targeting the calves and targeting targeting the tibialis muscles. So choose one or two variations and add them into your weekly training. It could be on your lower body strength day or it could be just on a flexibility day that you're going to add this in. Remember, we want high numbers of repetitions. So it could be three sets of 20 repetitions. We want long time under tensions or isometric holds. So lasting longer than 60 seconds that you're going to do um, in a set of calf raises. Best to start with single leg variations um, and so you can isolate left and right and work on building them up. If you've definitely got a side that's stronger or more flexible, you should train that side second. So always start on the weaker or less flexible side, work that side first, and then repeat the same number of reps, the same weight, or potentially the same range of motion on the dominant side so that we start to bring them up and get them even before we start to overload both sides and try to go beyond you know, the ranges of motion that we have in the good side. Give it a try, see how you go. If you've got questions or comments about any of this, I'd love to hear it in the feedback. Just drop it below and I will get back to you. I hope you enjoyed my little flexibility rant and you learned something from this. It'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. And until next time, happy calf training.